Today's podcast includes commentary from a guest speaker. Neither the RIA Compliance Collective nor RIA Compliance Concepts is affiliated with the speaker or the company he or she represents. Whether your advisory firm has one or five people, compliance will always be an issue. RIA Compliance Concepts is more than just another service provider. We truly care about seeing our clients prosper. That's why we started our podcast, the RIA Compliance Collective, providing up-to-date compliance guidance. We're passionate about doing our job so you can focus on doing your job. We understand regulatory compliance like the back of our hands from full-service RIA registration Registration to annual compliance reviews and everything in between. We're here to get you there. Hello and welcome back to the RA Compliance Collective. I'm Megan Campbell and this is Ivan Barreto. Hi Megan, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Ivan? Pretty good. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Today on the show, we're going to change gears and discuss the broker-dealer world. As you all may know, Ivan and I are compliance consultants for registered investment advisors. So in that capacity, we're frequently asked about the broker-dealer side of the industry, whether it's people curious about the process to start a BD or people who are duly licensed wanting to know how their decisions may be affected by the compliance obligations of their broker-dealer. Because our backgrounds are more geared toward RIAs, we typically turn to other experts in the field to help with these questions, which is why we've brought in a special guest today. Kimberly McEnany is the president of Cerulean Securities Compliance, a compliance consulting firm servicing broker-dealers and investment advisors with various compliance responsibilities arising from federal and state securities laws, as well as rules of the various self-regulatory organizations such as FINRA. Kim has over 15 years of industry compliance experience and has served in a consulting capacity for over eight years. Prior to founding Cerulean, she was a compliance officer for both institutional and retail RIAs and broker-dealers, as well as an investment banking broker dealers and a national exchange. Thanks for joining us today, Kim. Thanks, Megan. And hi, Ivan. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thanks. So to start off, Kim, your compliance company name, it's such an interesting name for your firm. Can you tell us how you came up with the name? Oh, sure. I actually can't take credit for it. Someone else came up with it for me. But Cerulean is actually the name of a pigment that was used in the art world way back in the 18th and 19th century. And it's kind of like a color sort of ranging between like a deep blue and azure blue and the darker kind of sky blue. So it's sort of a play on the blue sky laws. That's the name. And and it's interesting because I it's a conversation starter. A lot of people ask me what the name is and what it means. So that's it. Yeah, that's very interesting how you came up with your name. When I started researching names to start our company as well, I initially wanted to see what would be the best fit and be straightforward and direct, but also something that was easily tied to compliance where people would Google search RIA compliance. And luckily, you know, this name, the you know, RIA Compliance Concepts was something that stuck out to me and it helps with Google search optimization as well. So whenever someone's looking for RIA compliance firms or whatever, we're typically one of the first thing, names up at the top of the list. So it was kind of a straightforward play on our company name and, and easier for people to find us too. That was a good reason for us doing it. So, but yeah, I mean, that Cerulean is definitely something that is a conversation starter. It sure is. I have uh, a funny story just real quick before we get started. I was corresponding via email not too long ago with somebody at FINRA and he responded back and said, hey, I love the name of your company. I don't see that very often. And he actually happened to have been an art history major in college. So he knew exactly what the word was and what the pigment was and all of that. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, so today, I think what we really want to do is dive into the process of starting a broker dealer. So Kim, can you talk a little bit about the timing it takes to become a new broker-dealer registered with FINRA and give us some insight as to the requirements of the new membership application? Sure. So when a firm goes through the new membership application process, which I'll refer to as the NMA, generally advise my clients and their teams to prepare for an eight-month process. Since FINRA is an SRO, they have a procedural requirement that is 180 days to approve an application once it's filed. That clock starts at the point in time where they consider the application to be in substantially complete form. 
So the application itself is a long document. It requires considerable responses, some in Q&A format and others with backup documentation and attachments and things like that. Those backup documents authenticate many of the answers in the Q&A. So in my experience, most firms can pull together the initial submission within 60 days. And that's the reason I tack on that extra 60 days to the process when I talk to clients. I have never personally had an NMA extend beyond FINRA's 180-day process, but I know others that have. On a very small number of applications, it's possible to have an early approval, but I wouldn't consider that to be the norm, nor would I say that that time frame is material. Generally, we're talking about a few days, maybe a week, but there isn't. it's not really possible to get an approval like 60 days ahead of time unless you're on a fast-track process. So typically, eight months is generally a reasonable expectation from start to finish from a timing standpoint. As far as the requirements of the application itself, so I want to point out that the NMA only applies to FINRA. Most firms will have other regulatory obligations, which we can talk a little bit about. But in addition to the procedural requirements, the NMA primarily focuses on the qualifications and standards for admission. It's modeled after those standards, though not exactly. Certain items to be addressed on that form include your contact and your general overview information. There's also a listing of the types of business activity the the broker-dealer intends on engaging in. Obviously, information about ownership, officers and directors, branch office information. There's licensing and registration procedures and things like that. But generally, the form itself is modeled after those standards. Okay. Um, You mentioned the uh, 14 standards of admission. Can you elaborate a bit more on those? Sure. There are 14 specific standards that FINRA will look at and analyze um, and make a determination on throughout the entire 180-day process. And that's really what they're delving into is making sure that the firm is capable of meeting each and every one of those standards. If there is even a single standard that the firm cannot meet, then your application will be denied. So the standards specifically are the first one being a complete and accurate application, the second one being licensing and registrations required by state and federal authorities and other self-regulatory organizations that you may need to be a member of. The third one is the applicant's capability to comply with industry rules, regulations, and laws. The fourth one is contractual and other arrangements and business relationships. The fifth one is business facilities, so your branch locations, your technology, your office structure. The sixth one is the adequacy of communications and operational systems. The seventh is determining the adequacy of the applicant's capital. The eighth is the adequacy of financial controls. Nine is control mechanisms consistent with industry practices. So basically on that one, FINRA is taking a holistic look at your entire system and making sure that those systems are adequate for the types of business that you're going to be operating, your personnel needs, staffing, capital, and all of that. Number 10 is your adequate supervisory system. 11 is record keeping. 12 is continuing education. 13 is sort of the catch-all. It's other information possessed by FINRA. So they do do background checks and and, um, look into other areas of the owners and staffing lives just to make sure that there isn't anything out there that would preclude you from becoming a member or owning a broker-dealer. And number 14 is just the consistency of the application in its entirety with the federal securities laws. And those seem like fairly standard business items. Is there anything that your clients are typically surprised by when you're reviewing these 14 standards of admissions with you during this process that you go through with them? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. There are two things that I always like to point out in the initial calls for a new broker dealer. The first one is licensing. So FINRA has supervisory requirements that include experience qualifications and examination qualifications. Most people are aware that to supervise a BD or representative, the person is required to obtain the Series 24 exam, which is the principal license unless you're on a, you know, unless you're doing a limited type of advisor like mutual funds and variable annuities only, then you could get a different exam like the 26. But generally speaking, firms are getting their principals and owners to pass the 24. However, when you're going through the NMA process, those individuals who are discharged with the responsibilities are required by the standards for admission to have at least one year of direct experience 
or two years of related experience in the subject area that they would be supervising. So for firms that are just beginning, if everyone is taking a supervisory exam for the first time to become qualified for the process, that the experience piece that FINRA look, is looking for becomes somewhat of a challenge. Of course, it can be overcome if the team has others that they're bringing on board or if there are circumstances to be presented which could satisfy those requirements, but it's something that has to be outlined in significant detail on the NMA. So that's one thing I always want to make sure people are aware of if they're coming into the ownership piece of a broker dealer, the supervisory piece, that it's not just, you can't just pass the exam and get the approval and you're onward and upward. You do have to meet those experience requirements. The other item that generally surprises firms is that all owners who have a role in the day-to-day operations of the firm are required to be principal licensed, even if they're at a holding company level or if they're involved in other activities. So there is one way to get around that if you have a complex structure and your ultimate owner is you know, off doing other things and he's not actually involved in the day-to-day activities. But anybody who is at the ownership level is required to take that Series 24 um, exams. And the final thing that I normally tell people when I'm on the initial call that's surprising is that all firms are required to have two principles that meet the experience qualifications we discussed. There is a two-principle waiver process for people that are sole proprietors. It's a difficult one to obtain, but it is there. It's available. But anybody that has more than one employee or owner in their firm or more than one representative is required to have two principals at the uh, supervisory level. Wow. That's definitely interesting. So Kim, can you walk us through the filing process and what happens after the NMA is filed? Sure. So the filing process itself is done online. There is, uh, once you decide that you're going to go down this process, you submit a form to FINRA before you even start working on the NMA to gain access to the system. They issue you credentials and then you have access to the system to be able to get in and start filling out the form and uploading documents. Once the firm files the NMA, FINRA staff in the membership department will review it to ensure it meets the substantially complete standards. Once that happens, then the clock starts ticking on that 180 days. FINRA has 30 days to complete the initial review of the information that was submitted once they've made the substantially complete determination. If you don't have a substantially complete determination, they'll get back to you and give you five days to correct it, though I've never seen that happen. And they will provide at that 30-day mark or, or shortly before it, they'll provide additional requested information. So FINRA then issues a written request for clarification or additional information, and then the firm has 60 days to respond to that first written request. After that, all the subsequent requests and responses are on a 30-day schedule. We generally recommend as a consulting firm, as does FINRA, that as you go through this process that you're expeditious with the responses and not take the full time frame so as to keep the process moving forward smoothly. The membership department then makes an evaluation basically throughout the remainder of the process of the information against the standards for application. When you get toward the end of of that 180 days, which is generally about 30 to 45 days out from approval, you will have what's called a PMI, and that is a pre-membership interview. All of the owners and generally the supervising principals are required to attend at the local district office a meeting. So FINRA has district offices around the country by geographic region, and it's the district offices are different from the MAP group that's reviewing the application. When the MAP group determines that you're headed for approval, they then set up the PMI and introduce you to the regulatory team that will oversee your ongoing membership which includes assigning you a regulatory coordinator, and then those that group will conduct your ongoing examinations, inquiries, things like that. The PMI takes place in the district office at FINRA. So everybody will go there. The district director or the associate director will be in attendance. Your regulatory coordinator will be there, and then any other FINRA staff that the district office wants to assign to your firm. Also, you'll have the participation of the MAP group via phone. I also generally attend the PMI with my clients to ease, you know, any anxieties about meeting the MAP group or the regulators in person. That meeting serves two purposes. 
it's primarily to introduce the firm to its new regulator and to set the tone kind of for a mutually beneficial relationship. And then secondly, it's a handoff, so to speak, from the MAP group. They discuss the remaining issues for the approval and any questions that the MAP group needs to address prior to the recommending of the approval. And then those issues are outlined during the meeting. And then a very quick follow-up letter is issued to the firm once the meeting is over. And once that response is complete, the decision is issued and membership is granted. Now for a short break. To learn more about Cerulean Securities Compliance, go to www.ceruleancompliance.com or call 816-858-7880. Cerulean Securities Compliance, offering solutions, not just answers. And now, back to the podcast. So, Kim, it seems as though that the NMA back and forth with FINRA includes a lot of upfront information. Can you give us an example of the type of additional information they would be requesting after the submission of the NMA of such an exhausted application process? Sure. That's a great question. And as an example, when the firm is initially working on, let's say, the capital and financial control section, we give FINRA information about where the capital is coming from and how much it will be. However, towards the end of the application process, the firm has actually reached the operational point where they've opened bank accounts in the name of the broker-dealer and they've funded the account. At that point, FINRA will request the signature cards for the checking account to ensure that only registered and supervisory people have access to use and disperse the BD's funds. Similarly, we respond to questions initially about the source of funds. That's included in the Q&A section of the NMA, but generally the firm isn't funded on day one of the application submission process because we're just not there yet. But prior to approval, FINRA will request documentation evidencing the source of funds and firms will be required to provide, for example, a statement from the account where the funds came from. Presumably, that's the owner's personal net worth or from a holding company or something like that. And then they'll also request the statement from the account where the deposit went into. So as the process moves forward and we answer questions about the anticipated business of the firm and those contracts get in place, those accounts get in place, you start getting your operational systems up and running that's part of the additional information that FINRA will be requesting. So, Kim, obviously this is a lot of information about the NMA process. How much does it cost to file an NMA? Well, it depends on the size of the firm. Uh The NMA fees range from $7,500 to $55,000. But the vast majority of NMAs are going to be in the $7,500 tier. So small firms, which include those firms with less than 150 registered representatives, are in the $7,500 tier, and there are three tiers there. So for firms in the small tier, which is less than 150 reps, with less than 10 reps, they're in tier one, and the fee is $7,500 to submit the application. Tier two includes a rep base of between 11 and 100 with a corresponding fee of 12,500. And then finally, still in that small firm tier of less than 150, if the firm reaches the third tier threshold between 101 and 150 reps, the fee is 20,000. And then it goes up from there to medium-sized firms with two tiers and large firms with three tiers. But I can't imagine FINRA sees many NMAs with 500 plus reps on day one. I certainly have never done one, and I don't expect to, Um, but that's just the application fee, and there are other fees. Can you um, describe some of the other fees that clients should be aware of? Sure. If you, obviously, if you hire a consultant or an attorney to help you through the NMA process, those fees are on top of the NMA fee. There's also initial fees, even really prior to approval for branch office registration, which is $75 per branch. Fees for each registered representative who becomes associated with the firm through the U4 process. Um, Those are $100 per form and an added uh, disclosure processing fee of $110 for any of those U4s containing a disclosure response. There are fingerprint processing fees of up to $40 each. 
qualification exam fees, uh, which vary based on the type of exam being taken, and of course, the state registration fees, which can range from anywhere from $75 to $600 for the firm per state, and then roughly $18 to $20 to $150 per registered rep per state. So if you are just operating in one state, those registration fees are minimal. If you are going to become a regional broker dealer and work in, you know, a, a region of the United States or in every state, now you're talking upwards of fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to get your entire firm registered in all of those states with all of your reps there. So keeping on the topic of fees, can you talk a little bit about the ongoing fees of owning a BD? Sure. This one can sometimes be a bit of a shocker. The ongoing expense of owning a broker-dealer is it's significant. One fee that is actually an upfront cost, um, but I lump generally into the ongoing cost, is the fixed expenses in the first year. This is a big ticket item. Prior to approval, as FINRA is going through the NMA process with you, you will obviously be required to provide financial statements and pro formas. FINRA requires that the firm's bank account holds sufficient cash to cover the firm's first entire year of fixed expenses. This can range anywhere from $25,000 to $100,000 for those firms that we discuss with less than 10 representatives, and certainly it can go up from there. Variable expenses are not required to be included in this number, but it can be kind of a big shock to have to park that money in an account up front and it is required to be there before they will grant your approval. So that's a big number, and it's on top of capitalizing the firm. In addition to the first year of fixed expenses, some of the other ongoing costs include your fidelity bond, which depending on the size of your firm is anywhere between $1,000 and $25,000 a year. Yeah, We just talked a little bit about the state registration and rep fees. Those are annual fees. So once you are registered in the state at the upfront new membership process, then those fees continue annually. And they can range anywhere from a couple thousand dollars to $50,000 and then on up from there if you have a very large firm. Your clearing firm deposit, depending on the type of business that you are running, if you are a fully disclosed firm and you have a clearing firm arrangement, you generally have a clearing firm deposit, which is just an account of cash sitting at your clearing firm. And it generally is either required to be equivalent to your net capital requirement or 120%. So net capital requirements, depending on your business line, can range from $5,000 up to $250,000 just on the standard computation. Then, of course, there's the alternative standard, but that money also just sits there. So you've got your first year of fixed expenses, you have your clearing deposit, and then you also have your money that is tied into your net capital computation. Third-party email archiving and cloud-based storage that is 17A4 compliant, which means that the electronic information that you are maintaining as part of your books and records requirements is compliant with SEC and FINRA standards for WORM formatting. The financial audit. This is a big one. All FINRA broker-dealers are required to be audited by a PCAOB accounting firm as part of the financial responsibility rules that sort of came out of the wake of the Dodd-Frank rules. Those audits can be, even for the smallest firms that have less than five representatives, can start at $10,000 a year, and they go up from there. The CIPIC assessment, which is based on revenues, all broker-dealers are required to have an independent AML audit, which the cost on that varies based on your business type. But generally, for firms that are in that first tier with the $7,500 that have less than 10 reps, it's generally somewhere between $1,000 and $5,000, depending on their business lines. The FINRA GIA assessment, which is based on revenues, you have advertising fees, E&O insurance. So there are a number of fees that are associated with owning the broker-dealer that aren't necessarily associated with other types of businesses, simply because of the rules and the regulations. So, um, Kim, as we begin to wrap up, can you comment quickly on a couple other things? One, what are the typical business lines? You've been doing this for several years. What are the typical business lines that most people that approach you about setting up a broker-dealer firm, what are the typical business lines that they're looking to start with a broker-dealer firm to do business in? Sure. So generally, I work with two sort of, I will say, separate and distinct types of BDs. One being M&A firms, firms that are doing mergers and acquisitions 
and private placements. So they are basically small investment bankers that are working generally in the middle market and they are buying and selling companies. They don't work with a lot of individuals. They don't sell general securities products and they are just holding a securities license in the event that they are required to be licensed to sell or to effectuate a certain type of deal that that falls outside of either the you know the SEC M&A broker letter or outside of an asset sale. So that's one type of firm. An M&A firm is the simplest type of firm to set up because many of the requirements are not applicable just because of that business line. And then the other type of business that I normally do ranges from a general securities broker to a regional broker. And those are firms that are fully disclosed. They're generally not self-clearing. They are usually a branch office of a larger firm that's breaking off to set out on their own and they're selling general securities products. So they're doing stocks, bonds, options, mutual funds, variable annuities, selling insurance, and they may even have an RIA. And those firms are typically between 1 and 15 people where they are going down the path of starting a broker-dealer so that they can sort of capitalize on some of the additional commissions and income that they would be giving to or had been giving to somebody else in the industry. I have very few that start from scratch with no experience in the industry at all. As far as other regulatory bodies, is there any other regulators that firms need to pay attention to? Sure. The SEC, of course, the Securities and Exchange Commission, all broker-dealers are required to become registered with the SEC and an SRO. FINRA is an SRO, which is a self-regulatory organization. The vast majority of broker-dealers are registered with FINRA, but other securities exchanges also serve as SROs. So theoretically, a firm based upon its business model could become a broker-dealer without FINRA membership if one of the other SROs accepts them into membership. There's no cost or application process to become a registered BD with the SEC um, other than the submission of the form BD through FINRA's system. The SEC relies upon the SROs to approve membership. Then as a broker-dealer, you're required to comply with both the SEC rules and the SRO membership rules. Uh, Once the SRO membership is approved, SEC follows on the same day and it's reflected in the system. Also, BDs are required to become registered with SIPC, which is the Securities Investor Protection Corporation. And then if the firm is conducting municipal activities, then they would have a membership with the MSRB, which is the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. And then, of course, the state securities regulations as well. That's very interesting information, Kim. So, Megan, um, at this point in time, do you have any other additional questions that you have? No, I don't. I just want to thank Kim uh, for joining us today. I know I've learned a lot and I was mentally tallying up the cost of becoming a BD. And I knew it was an expensive process. I did not realize exactly how expensive it was until today. (laughs) It Um, is. That is certainly a conversation that I've had multiple times. People sometimes get a little shell-shocked with how expensive the initial cost and then the ongoing cost is. And then, of course, in addition to the cost you're bringing on, especially if you're leaving from another firm, you're bringing on liability. You know, you have regulatory liability, supervisory liability. So it's an important decision. And we have, as a consulting firm, several times just been engaged to help work people through the decision itself. Where are you now? What does the compliance and operational support, back office support look like? What is your commission schedule? Are you W-2? Are you 1099? And compare kind of those situations with where they would be headed and what additional liability would take on. And sometimes people aren't truly ready for it. Yeah, no, I, I believe that. <laughs> I believe it too. Okay. Well, Kim, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And Megan, I guess we'll just close this out. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to, again, I want to thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge and your insight with our listeners. I know I found great value in it, so I know they will too. And just for our listeners' edification, we are going to have a link to Kim's bio and Cerulean's website on our show notes. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today and hope you join us next time on the RA Compliance Collective. Until next time, we're here to get you there. 
Thank you for listening to the RIA Compliance Collective. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you want to experience the RIA Compliance Concepts difference yourself, visit riacc.io. From mock audits to customized compliance procedures, ongoing compliance assistance, and beyond. We're here for you always. Keep listening to discover more on how you can keep your advisory firm compliant so you can focus on achieving your goals. RIA Compliance Concepts. We're here to get you there.